Welcome to the Enrichment Today podcast, hosted by Dr. Amy Blancett and the Drew Lewis Foundation. This podcast covers topics to improve stability and find tranquility in your life. Join us as we discuss topics to improve your financial health, change your limiting beliefs, increase your wellness, and so much more. If you like Enrichment Today, make sure to follow the Drew Lewis Foundation and Enrichment Today on social media. Now sit back, relax, and learn to break some crayons with us. Hi, everybody. It's Holly Melton, and I'm with the Drew Lewis Foundation. This is our podcast, Enrichment Today, and I'm the Director of Development over at Drew Lewis, and one of the best parts of my job is I get to talk to individuals in the community. And today I have an individual from the Springfield community that does some of the most important work in the city, the county, probably the state. And um, I'm looking forward to everybody hearing the story about Ozark Food Harvest. And today I have Ozark's Food Harvest, <laughs> that's a mouthful, it is. CEO and President Bart Brown. And I just want to thank you so much for being here. It's me was in time. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited. We met at um, an award ceremony. Was it around Foundation? Was it around Christmas? Yes. Yeah. And um, I was like, I got to talk with him because we are partnered with Ozark Sweet Harvest. Um, every Thursday, one of the things that we benefit from, our families benefit from, is this enormous produce delivery. Um, and they're in these boxes, they call them banana boxes, but they're full of fruits and vegetables. Maybe they're not all pretty, but it's fabulous produce uh, that we're able to share with our families. And so that helps make their food budget go just a little bit further. But we're talking pineapples, dragon fruit, kiwi, strawberries, blueberries, um, tons of potatoes, asparagus, broccoli. I mean, delicious, delicious food. So it's a huge blessing. And I, I'm a fan of Thursdays. I don't always get there to help unload, but I love to go down and see what we got. It's fun. Well, you know, one of the things, the reason is that we concentrate on produce distribution so much, Holly, is that there's a, a disproportionate number of eating-related illnesses among um, the disadvantaged or low-income population because simply it costs more to eat better. Mm -hmm. uh, and fresh produce, lean protein, those kinds of things are very important if you want to eat health healthfully. Mm -hmm. But traditionally, people have thought about food pantries in terms of canned vegetables, right. canned food items, and things like that. But when we surveyed clients, what we found was that most clients or neighbors really wanted access to fresh, healthy produce. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the downside of that is that it's harder to handle. It's got a very short shelf warning. Mm -hmm. You've got to get it in and out and uh, very quickly. It's not like canned food where you can keep it in a warehouse. So we need lots of partners in order to get that out, in order to just shorten that chain, if you will. And so partners like you do really help. You are the last mile with that food. And you are the last mile to getting that into the hands of, of the people that need it. And that's what makes these partnerships so cool, uh, is that we all have different roles to play. And if we play together, more people get served than ever before. And that's what you guys, that's the whole focus of your organization. Uh, and it's been ours too. And I think that's one thing that we are here to talk about is the power yeah. of partnerships. Yeah, the power to collaborate. And I, um, what you said about the food going back quickly, one of the things that we're trying to teach our families is um, how to prepare it, how to freeze dry, how to make sure you freeze or make broth or you know, how to make it really work more than just, I have broccoli, you know, I got to put it in a pan with some water, boil it down and feed it to my kids, make it more appetizing. But you're right, a lot of the food, um, when you have, like any other time we, we bring in donations for food, it's cans and boxed items. Mm -hmm. And it is harder to eat healthy when most of everything that's reasonable is ramen and mac and cheese. Right. So these produce boxes have been a huge blessing. Tell me though, I was, so I did a little research before you came over 
And what I understand is that you are part of Feeding America, mm -hmm. who are one of the food banks. Correct. And Feeding America um, is a huge source of um, trying to defray hunger in the United States. And I think what we take for granted is you don't really associate severe hunger with the United States. Right. And yet it is, we are in, we are going through food insecurity at a level that's not been seen for many, many decades. Correct. Um, so tell me what you're seeing, how will you be addressing that in the, in the Ozarks at least? Well, let me, let me start with Feeding America and Feeding America is the largest, the nation's largest, uh, Hunger League charity. <clears throat> and there are 200 food banks like Ozark Street Harvest that belong to the Feeding American Network. Uh, and so we all have a service area. Our service area is um, a third of the state of Missouri. So we cover us a third of 28 counties, uh, a third of the geographical area of the state, about 20 Denison square miles. This is what we are responsible for. There's actually five other Feeding, feeding America food banks in the state of Missouri. Uh, and so working together, we form a, a, a state organization called Feeding Missouri. We, we work with legislators um, to advance federal um, spending programs in our state, uh, such as SNAP uh, and the SNAP program, or it used to be known as Food Stamps. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we work with um, state, state legislators and officials to administer federal food programs that go through the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture. And so that's that's a, a state and federal partnership that we have um, that addresses hunger. Uh, and the concept of food banking was started back in the 70s uh, in, in uh, Arizona. And it was started in relationship to um, local land fits actual, not lender. And so what was happening was uh, in a local community, they were actually throwing away more food that they could take plant bill space for. Because in the 70s, it was more efficient to run manufacturing lines 24 seven. Mm -hmm. And then get, if there were excess product, if was, if there was product that ran out of labeling or whatever, that product just got thrown away. Oh, and as a country, we were literally throwing them away more food than we could take might have fiddle space. Oh, my goodness. And that's, so that is the problem that food banking first address is what do we do with all this wasted food? Well, we have hungry people in uh, America and uh, in the 70s and 80s saw that decline in federal food programs such as um, food stamps slam things um uh we we saw welfare reform uh and so we saw a lot of less federal spending and more emphasis on uh local communities being the source uh, and the resource for um hydrogen. and so that's kind of where this whole so so things became very decentralized in a way from the federal government and into private charities where we started to reclaim food that was going to waste and then use that food to feed hungry people. Really, the one of the richest countries in the world. Um, we still uh, throw away close to a hundred billion, with a B, uh, pounds of edible food a year. Uh, and so one of the things that food banking addresses in addition to feeding hungry people is using resources that we already have to solve problems that are ongoing. Does that make sense? My gosh, that is, I can't believe in the 21st century we still discard a billion. Yeah, waste is a, it's a huge problem in our country. So hunger in the United States looks very different from hunger in other countries and uh, undeveloped nations. So um, it's a distribution and an equity problem in, in the United States. Uh, it's not a production problem. It's not, uh, we don't have enough food. Now, we do talk about food deserts as being right. places where, you know, it's 40 miles to a grocery store, things like that. But that's very different than living in a country where they literally can't produce enough food for their population. So 
it's a it's a very different problem than that we have here. Uh, it does have a lot of moving parts uh, to to solve it. So, for instance, uh, was our street harvest partners with got over 120 different local retailers to pick up and eat store 120 stores leftover food every week that might be going into a dumpster. Uh, and we had partnerships with everybody, any anybody that you could mention. Um, we have partnerships in picking up their waste. And what that does for our corporate partners, uh, like Walmart, is it saves on their waste bills tremendously. And they would be paying them to do to, to get rid of that stuff. A lot of it perfectly edible, but you know they just can't sell it if it's coming up toward uh, a sell by debt. So, um, but they can donate it, and then we can turn around and distribute it here. And so that we we work as partners with our corporate entities to help them manage their logistics of their food warehouses because space is expensive. Mm-hmm. And so we work to help them clear that out. Uh, so it's an ongoing partnership there on the supply side of things. And then on the distribution side of things, we had partners like you guys um, who distribute food directly to uh, the folks that need it. My gosh, I've wondered because in anyone who goes to the grocery, you see food that's close to expiration, especially of produce. And I think, what happens to this because it's still edible um that's i'm it's it gives me uh hope to know that that's happening but i'm sure there's still a large amount that's still wasted surely there there's a lot of and what we try to do at ozark street harvest are you know our main goal of course is transforming hunger into how yeah Oh. Yes, that's but, their uh, mission. I love that. The mission is transforming hunger into all oh, I have a story about that. But, um, but we have a lot of other missions that we touch through our work, and um, uh, the environment is one of the biggest areas that we mm-hmm. touch. Uh, last year alone, we saved over 400 semi trucks for being dumped in Green County's landfill. Oh my gosh. It's just us. In one year, 400 semi trucks. And picture that we picture that part together, 400 trucks, and we saved that much space in our local landfill just by reclaiming food that was perfectly good. Right. Um, and one thing that you'll learn from volunteering in Ozark Sweet Harvest is the difference between true exploration dates and marketing dates, which are sell by or best of use by dates. And so best if used by date uh, or sell by date is a marketing date. Someone like me, who was a communication major with absolutely no qualifications, have said, we want to sell this product by this date. And that's what the date, the sell by date is. There may be some, there, it may like a little color and may like a, a, a slight difference in flavor profile after four years. But if it's a if it's a secured sealed product, mm-hmm. a bottle of salad dressing will last for a long, long time past its sell by date. So one thing that volunteers always tell me is that oh my gosh, I save so much money on my grocery bill just by volunteering here and learning what's a true expiration date and what is a marketing date. That's so, a very good point. And so that is a very uh, that's a leading factor behind how a lot of household waste occurs uh, with food in this country. Uh, so That's a powerful point. I mean, there are some things that obviously you can't take too far past. But at, the other day, Amy mentioned that eggs from the chicken can last a month unrefrigerated. And, you know, I'm over here thinking I got to put them in the fridge right away. But um, that's remarkable to me. And... Uh, you know, all of the dates on the cans and I can, for as long as I can think of going back, it was don't keep anything past the expiration date. It's not going to be healthy. Yeah. The only thing is most manufacturers don't put an actual expiration date on, on the product. So I have a sell by date or you have a SDA use by date. But oftentimes the expiration date, unless it's a perishable product, 
is in a code that you have to go on a website and type into, which is what we do at Ozark's Food Harvest. So when we get product that is approaching its sell-by date, we can contact the manufacturer and say, what's the actual expiration date on this program, on this product? How, how long do we have as a food bank to distribute this safely? And oftentimes that expiration date is going to be six months to six years past oh the actual gosh. sell-by date. And we get permission from manufacturers. We get their blessing in, and their, uh, uh, their authority to donate these products with their names on them, uh, even though they're past their sell-by date because, it's going, it, because the product's perfectly healthy. Mm -hmm. They just don't want it on the supermarket shelves. And it's a certain day. I'm, I love knowing that because, I, you know, I mean, I, we have a family member say, can I eat this? So it's good to know. My gosh, I had no idea. So we were, and then, not to go down a rabbit hole, but then we actually work with manufacturers to get extensions on their expiration dates. So expiration dates aren't necessarily hard and fast. If it's a securely packaged, non-perishable product, like a can get it. So oftentimes expiration Extensions on expiration dates are six months to a year past the actual expiration date. So, so it's, it's, that's something that we do, and that's a really good example of how we work together with other organizations. Mm -hmm. As an organization, Drew Lewis may not have the resources to know on that or to contact or to know who to contact at manufacturers to get that information. And the good news is you don't have to because there's an organization that does that for you. And we do that for about 300 different nonprofits across a third of the state. And the model there is let's have one expert in logistics and food safety and transportation and getting product donated. And then let's let all of you guys do what you do best, which is serve individuals. But we'll take the logistics out of the worry for because you don't have trucks and have drivers, you don't have toddlers. You don't have any of that, and we do. And so for us, it's very much about how do we live barriers? How do we get rid of barriers that are keeping people from serving their neighbors? And so for us, it's always been about food, equipment, expertise, and, and infrastructure. So our partners need us to do all of that. So that you know, we provide 70% of the food um, that our members serve. So if 70% of charitable food in Southwest Missouri comes through Ozarks. We don't like us, that's a huge honor. And it, it, it is, it's very significant. And 70, and mo many of it we serve are the faith community. So there's also kind of a, a misconception um, that the faith community kind of does all this for us. And you know the faith community is very stretched, and and people just depend on the faith community for everything. And even though we have a lot of churches and a lot of faith partners in this part of the country, uh, you know, faith-based organizations are not full of resources. They're full of people, <laughs> and so that's their resource. And so we provide our faith-based partners, which are about half of our partners with 70% of the resources they need to run their missions. Mm. And so that is what we found is critical to removing barriers for a purpose. They don't have the food locally. Uh, they don't have local leadership as far as being a board member. They don't even have a bank in some of these communities. Um, so they need... They need resources, they need infrastructures. What they have are people and volunteers. Yeah, and I, you don't really realize how, um, how much hunger is spreading, especially through the rural communities. Mm -hmm. And so to have Ozark Food Harvest be the, the crux, the, the foundation for getting those foods distributed to like you said, the faith-based community or organizations like Drew Lewis Foundation, um, that is a game changer. Um, and I think people are hopefully facing less and less hunger. Although I, I think I just read recently that benefits have been cut because they were increased during the COVID period. 
and then recently brought back down. Right. And so what we found is that um, it's a, and it's a little uh, disheartening, not disheartening, but it's an opportunity, as we like to say. Uh, what we found is that we have actually more clients uh, now or neighbors now mm -hmm. seeking food assistance than we did at the height of COVID. They're just different people. At the height of COVID, what we had were a lot of people that were um, dislocated workers because their place of business had closed down. A lot of restaurant workers, a lot of service industry workers, a lot of folks that were suddenly unemployed. And so we went, we just took our mobile food pantry trucks from church trucks that just distribute food, like we did here, thank um, and uh, the, we went directly to large employers that were laying up workers and did these very quiet, under the radar, mm -hmm. private mobile food pantries for people yes. in the places where they've been laid up. So they knew where to come because these are people that had never had to access the, uh, the, the charity network before. So they didn't know their way around. But now what we see are um, what we see are in the sky high food inflation. We saw sky high fuel costs this summer um, and housing costs, especially in Springfield at Southwest Missouri, as a percentage of household income, are shrewd. They're just, uh, they're just almost unmanageable. So higher housing costs, higher fuel costs, um, uh, 40 year high inflation on food. So that has a new kind of neighbor coming to our food pantries, and these are working folks right. that can't make it work with the current economy. And I've seen some of the research that I saw today, which most of us, I think, know, is there's many, many people, and uh, seniors especially, that have to sacrifice medicine or food. And we see that on ads on television, and we think it's just... It's almost trivialized to a point, but it is a huge reality. It really is. There's, there's, uh, that's kind of a passion of mine because there's much fewer uh, safety nets for seniors than there are other age groups, um, and um, seniors are more hesitant to ask for help. Right. Also, uh, and one of the things that we've done, we have a, a mobile produce pantry now just for senior citizens that's operating in four of our little counties that provides just fresh produce uh, to seniors. And and here's the thing about serving seniors with food assistance, they cook, yeah. you know what I mean? That's true. Um, now, we, um, you, you guys do this with your, kin with, with your activities, you're teaching people how to cook with fresh food. Mm -hmm. But we've lost that yeah. as a generation, kind of. Um, and so um, we find that programs like you, where you're actually teaching people what to do with food. Um, we have a community garden program called Full Circle Gardens. Um, and one of the things that we just did was distribute 5,000 uh, garden to go kits. Mm -hmm. And there, it's a, it's a kit full of seeds. There's a booklet of instructions, and then there's barcodes. You can click your phone and get detailed and planting instructions like harvesting and recipes. And there were, we distributed that to our agencies to distribute to their, their clients. And 5,000 went that. Uh, and uh, we're, we're in the process of doing more of that. But that involves growing, that actually involves adding to the food stream. I well, I mean, yeah. Add, add, add. We get um, produce on a cake. We have Springfield Community mm -hmm. Gardens here. Right. And oftentimes they'll supplement right. the produce boxes. Uh -huh. But um, that is tremendous to have your own. It is. You're teaching them how to grow their own food. Right. And we're also working with some disadvantaged folks to grow some culturally appropriate food. There's a large Congolese population in McDonald County, just north of the Arkansas border, um, north of Bentonville. Uh, and we're working with a, a food pantry down there um, to grow some culturally appropriate foods that they're used to, that they can hack it there as well through our, our bath circle program. And again, all of this is because of partnerships, which is our original conversation. We talked about the importance of partnerships. And so none of us do this work of all. And we can do so much more when we work together because there's no way I would even know about a Congolese population in McDonald County if we didn't have an agency. We didn't serve an agency here. 
I, I, my daughter lives in Colombia because that's where she goes to college and there's a huge refugee population up there. Right. And uh, she's involved in an organization that helps out and, and they use the... Um, the big back up there. The, and the, the garden up there that they have. They have a community garden as well. So it's... Uh, I love knowing that people are getting more than macaroni and cheese and, you know, the, the ramen and that type of thing. They're, they're learning that you can eat healthily and it doesn't have to be expensive and then it can go a lot further than you realize. Um, some of the other programs I want to mention, and then I want to come back to, you said you had a story about um, the transforming hunger into hope the motto, but I do want to bring up that um, you have these programs that I think are remarkable. You have the weekend backpack program, uh, the mobile food program, which we've kind of discussed, uh, after school and summer meal program, and then seniors, a new program for seniors. I love the weekend backpack program too. I think that's... Well, we started that back in 2003. Um, and. I had gotten the idea from a food bank in Arkansas, I believe, uh, that were do, was doing it, and we, it, and it was just what it was. It was like it, there was um, at the time um, we were dealing with extreme poverty, extreme child poverty, uh, and really looking at the rural counties that we were serving. Some of the counties that we were serving in our outlying areas, like Ozark and Shannon County, a hundred percent of the kids were. Um, in the student free and reduced school lunch program, a hundred percent. We have ninety percent schools here, but it was just you know a hundred percent were qualifying. So every child in the school was living in poverty, and so we we started this in three schools in in Gainesville, um, uh, also in Ozark County, and basically the program provides. Um, uh, we had a nutritionist design it, and they're individually sized packages because they're made for little ones. Okay, so they're made for grade school aides kids. We do something a little different from high school, but grade school through middle school, they are individually uh, sized uh, entrees, um, fruit cups, um, just rice, um, beans, all kinds of stuff that's already prepared. You you don't have to have adult supervision to get into it. It's all pop top zip tops. There's utensils in there because a lot of kids are on their own uh, doing this and. Um, we also provide some toiletries uh, in there as well and some snacks. So basically they get three nutritionally complete, complete meals for Saturday, Sunday, plus toiletries and snacks. So, uh, and it's nutritionally complete, but it also is designed to weight requirements yeah. so that a five-year-old doesn't hurt themselves taking food home. See, oh. We get so we really did try to think of every right, right, and so um, we we and so the school nurse in Gainesville said, "Well, the first thing I saw literally was the color of their scale chat. Oh my goodness! And then I saw the whites of their eyes start to brighten, and then I saw them start to participate in class a little more." And I saw absentee rates go down, um, and it was all. Be and I saw self-esteem going up because, even though I didn't know who it was, there was somebody that cared in that about that to feed them. And so since that time, we're now in uh, sixty, almost seventy schools across the United States providing uh, providing that program free of charge uh, to school, and that's a major. Um, budget expense for us. That's about a half a million dollar program just in there uh, in terms of that. Uh, but, you know, it's a very important program because it does help kid, keep kids in school. Uh, and it also supports our other programs because, so, you know, we've got after school feeding programs that get uh, funding through federal uh, dollars. There are summer feeding programs that also get uh, uh, funding through federal dollars. So those are uh, funds that are available um, that are just adding to the resources here in our communities. Um, and then there's one thing that we are really working up, if I can talk just a little bit about that, and that is the grab-and-go um, program. 
And that's a program that came about during COVID. Um, and it relates to how you can serve um, low-income kids or children in the summertime with uh, school meals. And the uh, always before the rules from the SDA have been that you have to feed the children on site. They have to come on site and they have to consume the food on site. And that's been a limitation to growing the program just for a lot of different reasons, transportation, um, um, you know, a uh, time, uh, parents working, just a lot of different things. Uh, so during COVID, um, USCA uh, and Congress waived that and said, you can do grab and go meals where you're, you know, you can sit somebody to get that meal and break, you know, where you can have the parents pick it up or you can have the kids pick it up or you can have the school deliver it to a neighborhood. And that's what happened in Springfield. And it was very, very effective. Um, and then since that time, Congress had, has since given that flex, made that flexibility permanent for all of the states. Um, but it's up, it's, a, it's up to the state to choose to opt in or out with that program. I will tell you that out of the 50 states, Missouri is the only one that has opted not to take that flexibility. So we cannot, at this point, serve the grab-and-go um, uh, as, as we did in COVID in the state of Missouri. We are working legislatively with the governor's office and DSS um, diligently to uh, to move toward a solution there um but all i can all i can tell you right now i can't tell you any reasons why we're not all i can tell you is that we are the only state leading one that has has not extended that flexibility uh yet so um i'm getting my thoughts together on that you know those are the types of things that it's important to know again partnership communication because you can affect change with your vote. Right. And that's a very important thing to be aware of. And those are things that everybody covers. So I'm so grateful you mentioned um, that right now we are on the only state that, that does not allow our children to have meals to go. Uh, and yet we are one of the biggest states that deals with poverty and hunger. Um, and the other thing that's very important that I want to mention, being on the development side, I know what's involved in writing a grant and the information you have to provide and the proof that you can manage the funds. And it's not an easy task. So you all are getting these funds because of the type of organization you are. You are a proven organization uh, with your management financially, Everything has been proven, and uh, that's a huge feather in your cap because this funding is coming through. You are being productive and helpful to the community, and um, I think, as we said, we can make our vote heard, knowing that little bit of information just kind of might push you a little bit more to get to the polls with the next round of elections. So, you know, so I'll tell you what we'll do, and this is something, this is a matter of our functions. We have a legislative person on our team mm -hmm. at o o Ozark Sweet Harvesting. With our partners, we, if there is a time where we need some, some action in terms of correspondence, things like that, or a dedicated effort, we will uh, be sure to let you guys in that yeah. And right now we're just still very much in we let's see why this is happening and see what the best uh, what the best answer is to to solve this. So and that's kind of that's kind of what we did. We we uh because as you say with you, um we are fortunate we worked very hard to earn the respect of both um our partners as well as our legislators, Senate and after that and, and our elected leaders. So I think we're a trusted voice. Uh, and and uh, we we certainly work hard to make every everyone's voice heard. But what is most important to us is all the neighbors and clients that we serve through our partnerships, because those are the voices that we tend yes. not to listen to, and they're the first ones that we need to. Be. We were now we we were distributing five percent of our total pop, of our total distribution needs to be fresh produce. 
and now it's 25 percent and that would not have been the case had we not just asked our clients what is it that you're not getting yeah i think it's so important because the under-resourced communities the low to moderate income fa uh, families often don't feel seen or heard so the more we can make them seen heard valued and involved and involved yeah volunteering um that's so vital to a part, going a long way to solving the problem. You have to have everyone's voice. Well, you really do. And if you've never faced hunger before, mm -hmm. why on earth, why on earth, would give you any qualifications to tell anyone mm -hmm. how to fix it? I have often thought we need, so we do panels here at the foundation, um, and we'll have community members on those panels. And I think every state, needs to have some type of citizen panel. And it can't just be the individuals that are most well-known in the community. It has to be the people that you rarely see and that are just trying to get through their day with work and taking care of their kids. It has to be everybody's voice that's heard. Um, well, to bring it back and hopefully end it with a high note, <laughs> um, I want to know more about how your mission statement came about. Well, our mission statement, and you're, you're in development, I used to, I started, you know, I, I went from radio into um, development, and it's another story for another chum, but <laughs> you know, um, you'll appreciate this. We had your typical mission statement that was like a paragraph long. No one could remember it because it was so long, and it was like a little mini grant application in it. Lots of big <laughs> words, empowering, enabling, blah, blah you know. And, and so anyway, I was pretty new in my tenure. Hello, I'm trying to say. Anyway, I was fairly new, and I was meeting with Pete Hershett, the owner of we Half City. Uh, to ask him for a contribution to our capital campaign for to build the first free bank guy that we did in 2009. And we met and he was like, he, he wanted to see all my materials and uh, he looked and he's like, wait, what's your mission statement? And I showed it to him because I couldn't decide it. And it, he was <laughs> like, this is crap. <laughs> He's like, no one could remember this. You know what the mission statement for us for Silver Dollar City is? It's four words. It's creating memories worth repeating. Oh, Paul. And I was like, well, that's the best mission statement for an amusement park I've ever heard. Um, and so what he did was he um, allowed us access to his top marketing curve set out. And they worked with our team to come to drill down what it is that we actually did in score words. And we came up with transforming hunger into hope. Oh my gosh. I did not thank Mr. Urshan enough because those four words are what we work by every day at Nozard Sweet Harpist. And everyone in the organization can understand it. Everyone can recite our miss from, you know, we hire to a truck driver to a volunteer. They all know the mission of Ozark Street Art is to transform younger into help because mm. it's easy and it's true. It's what we do, you know. I love that. How long have you been in your position or with, with sure. Ozark Street I've been with Ozark Street Harvest now for 25 years. To see. Yeah, I mean, I know. I've seen a lot of changes. And you started when you were five. I did. That's remarkable. Yeah, well, I did. I was a child prodigy. <laughs> yeah. Now, this has been, is there anything else before we kind of, I want to make sure people know how to get in touch with Ozark Food Harvest, sure. you're donating as well as if there's a need, mm -hmm. um, collaboration. And so I want to make sure we cover that, but is there anything else that you want to cover? I'm going to make sure you have a voice. You know, the Alex, you know, here's, here's what I was like to end this with, because it is all about the, the power of partnerships and how far reaching relationships and friendships are. Because like you and with Strangville Community Gardens, which is here, we have a long-standing partnership with Baker Creek Seeds, which is an international, uh, it's the largest international heirloom seed company in the world, and it happens to be located in Mansfield, Missouri, not too far from us. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Uh, and 
they do exclusively heirloom the seeds. They provided all of our seeds for our garden kits to go. So all of those are heirloom seeds as well that are going to grow well in our climate here in Yosarts. But um, they also provided a lot of funding for our full circle garden uh, program. But the long story short is through their partnership, I got a phone call from a gentleman uh, in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. He emailed me to want to know a little bit about our charity because he was thinking about making a donation. And I ended up calling him and he said, well, he said, I'm very impressed with the organization. And he goes, the reason I got your name is that I and immigrated here from India. And I, my wife and I have always cooked uh, Indian uh, and vegetarian cuisine uh, for blue and Kenya population here. Mm-hmm. And I grow a lot of our seeds and I grow, get them through Baker Creek Seeds. And I asked, he goes, I'd like to donate where if I do business with um, um, and um, uh, he said I I asked Baker Creek Seed who was a good partner for this and they said it was our street harvest and we do all this stuff with them and so and I said well I'm so grateful that you called us and he said well I I will tell you why I immigrated um, to this country in 1966 I remember uh, getting off of the flight, I've been traveling for three days from India. I had $35 and in my pocket. Mm-hmm. I was so hungry and so tired. Mm-hmm. And when I got off at Passy or Bourguet, they were selling um, uh, hot chocolate. And it was 25 cents. And it was way, it was with 35 bucks in my pocket, it was way more than and I could justify. But there was a French immigrant standing next to me and she saw me looking at it and she said to me, I'm going to buy an I'm going to have a hot chocolate funk. And he said, that was the first of so many miracles that have happened to me in this country. And it is up to me having benefited from all of this. I, you know, I'm a retired industrial engineer. Um, I've had a tremendous career. I've worked for Fortune 100 companies, and now my wife and I spend our time for all the food and feed a bit to um, hundred people. They can't find uh, vegetarian Indian cuisine that they can eat according to their religious mm-hmm. beliefs, uh, and that's why he called me. And so that kind of story, that kind of connection, just came from a local. Uh, seed donation. And that's the power of partnerships. We don't even know how far our arms are each when we work together like we do with, with you guys and like you guys do with so many different organizations. And that's how we're going to, that's how we will lift our community up. Yeah, I agree with you. It takes all of us because it can't just be, there's no, um, a white person at the top that's just got it all figured out. We all depend on each other. We, I can't tell you the number of resources. We have a young woman that works here who's just brilliant with her community connections and the resources she's developed so that if somebody calls here and needs something and we don't have it or we don't offer that specific service, we can say, but yeah, here's what we can do. Because it's always about, I don't ever like to hear the word no, we don't do that. I'd like to hear, here's what we can do. Mm-hmm. And we will find a way to get you over here or we'll get you a bus pass to send you right here. But um, uh, we, I have to tell this story. About a month ago, our, we had an um, intern here who was cleaning and she took the trash out to the dumpster. Came back in and she said, I just saw a pair of legs in the dumpster. And so several of us jumped up and ran outside and there was this young man who had climbed into the dumpster because he was cold and he was tired and needed someplace safe. And um, he came in, used the restroom, and we got him a bag of non-perishable items together, some wipes, things that he could use without, you know, if he couldn't find a shelter. And um, he was so cold, he was shaking 
uncontrollably, we find out he's just 26. Um, and it was just heartbreaking. I was like, what can we do for this young man? So MMP, who's a Missouri Mentoring Partnership, one of our partners here in the building, was able to give him a best pass to get him uh, to the next place where he could get even more resources. But it was, you know, it just, that is what we have. We don't, we don't always see it. The general community doesn't always see it, but it's not the face of hunger and the face of poverty is, it's your neighbor. It is uh, your grandparents, it's your aunts, your uncles, and it's somebody that I think had to go find shelter in a dumpster. And, and we have that, that is a very real thing that happens in Springfield. Um, so to contribute to Ozark's Food Harvest, tell everybody the best way to make donations to your organization. Um, and then I wanna make sure if there's an email or a phone number you want to share that all that good stuff is out there. So people can Well, of yeah. course we're on the mend at Ozark's Food Harvest org. And that's Ozark's with an S Food Harvest dot org. I'm on Facebook, sending um, Insta and on uh, uh, Twitter. Um, saying said we're on all of that. Well, I don't follow all of ours. Um, but I understand that. <laughs> so you can find us. You can find us there. Um, our website is a great resource for if you want to volunteer. Um, you can actually do it online. Uh, you don't even have to call. You can actually do it online and schedule yourself, or or you're welcome to. What we found that a lot of people wanted to schedule online, so we. We're all about removing barriers, so sure. we, that was one that we did. Uh, and you can also find out how to, you know, how to help in other ways. The best way to help right now, there's two different ways, and, and that that can bring the most impact. Uh, and number one is to make financial donations. For every dollar, we can distribute about ten dollars yes. food. Yes. Um, and uh, then the other way is to volunteer. So we're always needing volunteers, both at a warehouse and at our full sort of gold garden uh, location in Rogersville. Uh, and again, that all that information is uh, is on my site um, as well. And if you want to give us on a call on uh, just the old fashioned uh, phone, it's uh, 417-865-3411. Um, so um, there's a lot of different ways to, to catch up with us. Um, you know, be there electronically or in Volt. And the website, one more time. Ozarksfoodharvest.org. And that's where everybody can go and to volunteer, make financial contributions because you can stretch a dollar mm -hmm. much farther than bringing in a, a case of vegetables, which is great. Uh -huh. But we still, the financial donations can really, really go. They really outlined the needle or than anything. Uh, that in the volunteer time. You can also learn all about our cool programs um, on the website and look at all of our partners throughout uh, 28 counties. So you'll see a ton of us, a ton of that on there. And we also do a lot of informal partnerships, you know. So, um, you know, there's a lot of folks that get free terms that are actually in our quote unquote, you know, network. Um, and, but that's just what we're here for as a food bank. Yes, I agree. That's, that's our, our goal is very service oriented and we're really about what can we do to get rid of barriers mm -hmm. that to keep people like you, um, we were the, the last mile. What are those barriers from the, to the last mile that we can eliminate? Mm -hmm. And, and that's what we're all about. Mm -hmm. That, and that sounds so easily said, but such a huge, huge, uh, necessary component and so beneficial to the Ozarks. So thank you so much for coming. I appreciate uh, having you here. Bart Brown, CEO and president of Ozarks Food Harvest. And thank you all for joining us this episode. My name again is Holly Melton. This is the Drew Lewis podcast of enrichment today. Have a fabulous day and thank you.